Good morning once again to Grace Community Church and for those of you that are on the internet watching us on YouTube, uh, <clears throat> Grace Community Church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And uh, this morning we're going to look at the Believer's Walk. And uh, <clears throat> by no way is this going to be exhaustive. <laughs> uh, we could go on for weeks and months talking about the Believer's Walk. But that particular verse, that uh, <clears throat> three verses that uh, Brunel read in Ephesians 4, that, especially that verse 1, is, it just kind of intrigued me. And uh, <clears throat> it says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech that you walk worthy, or I beg you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Now I've heard several Bible teachers and pastors you know, in this particular verse, it says, well, now, the vocation of what you were called, if you're a carpenter, or if you're an insurance salesman, or whatever, whatever you are, walk worthy of it. That's not at all what this verse is saying. Not at all. <laughs> Paul does not have that in mind whatsoever. Um, <clears throat> but the first part of that particular verse, it says, I therefore. If you have the word therefore, you want to find out why it's there, what it's there for. In other words, he's referring back to what he's already spoken of in chapters 1, 2, and 3 of Ephesians. And Ephesians is kind of, you can kind of split it in half. There are six chapters, so you got the first three chapters. It really talks about, uh, we would say, doctrine or position in Christ, what God has done for us. And then the last three chapters really talk about our walk, the believer's walk, how we should live. And the last three chapters are all based upon the first three. If you didn't have the first three, you just went right into the, to the second three, you'd be kind of confused. You wouldn't know exactly, have all the information that you need in order to walk worthy of the vocation in which you were called. So we need to look at that word, therefore. And to look at that word, therefore, we have to go back to the first three chapters, and we're not going through all, the verse by verse, all three chapters. However, we're going to look at some of the verses because it is very important. It, it, it lays the foundation for a believer to understand what Christ has done for you so you can walk worthy. You know, why do we walk worthy? Uh, why should we walk worthy? It's all based on what Christ has done for us. And we see this in the last part of this verse here. It says, I therefore, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that as we go on here. I don't want to get ahead of myself here. We're going back to Ephesians chapter 1. And I'm just going to go through some of the things here that, the, that God has blessed us with and with, through the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished on the cross of Calvary for us. And once we get that ingrained in our mind and we understand what the Lord Jesus Christ, and I, I <laughs> thank for now for what he went through speaking about the cross. Uh, that's just, that's right in this foundation. <laughs> that's all wrapped up in these few verses that we're looking at, Ephesians chapter 1. The Apostle Paul, of course, writing, he's writing to believers, and he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Notice it says, who hath, past tense, hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Every single believer who has put his trust in the Lord Jesus Christ has already been blessed with all spiritual blessings. They say, well, how can that be? We certainly don't experience those. No, we don't experience those. But positionally, we have uh, all the spiritual blessings that... Uh, uh, we'll, we'll see what some of them are here in, in chapter 1. But has already blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Notice it says, in heavenly places, in Christ. Now that, <clears throat> in, especially in chapter 1 of Ephesians, also in chapter 2, but especially chapter 1 of Ephesians, we see a lot of this little preposition in. I-N. And it, it comes from the Greek word, which is transliteration is en but that that particular word means in the sphere of so it's like a ball like a sphere and we're right in the middle of it 
when, if we are in Christ, we are in the middle of that sphere. If that's our position as a believer in Christ today. We can't get out of that sphere. We're in the center of it, and I don't know why anybody would want to get out of it. But that is our position in Christ. And it says also in heavenly places. Going to verse 4, it says, According that he has chosen us. Now, a lot of people get kind of squeezy about this. They really don't, well, how can, you know, God chose us. Okay, well, that's what it says. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Every single believer was chosen by God in eternity past, before the creation, before the foundation of the world. Now, do we understand that? No, I don't understand that. I, I mean, I'm, how can anybody really understand what that means? However, just because we don't understand it does not mean that it is not true. And it's a wonderful truth once you come you kind of a grasp that what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. And the more we study the scriptures, the more we find out that he was the one that did the work in our salvation, in our living, uh, in, our, in, our, in our life. But especially, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary that provided salvation for us. Okay, we're chosen us in before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Boy, that's something. <clears> that <throat> We should be holy and without blame. You know that there isn't a person alive, I don't care how good you are, I don't care what kind of a Christian you are, and if you've never even sinned, there's no way that you can get into heaven unless you are absolutely perfect and you have the righteousness of God. There's no way that you can enter heaven without being absolutely righteous. You know, and every believer has that righteousness. It is the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ that is upon each one of us. Positionally, we're talking about positionally, not experientially as we live on this earth, yes, but not not spiritually. <clears throat> okay, I'll turn my mic on now. <laughs> I saw Vernell's hand up. I don't think he. I don't know if he's talking about that. He's looking at something else. But anyway, uh, is that better now? Now you can hear me. Okay. Okay. Holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestinated us. Predestinated means simply to to mark out beforehand or. Um, uh, preordained, sometimes you can use the word ordained, but it's, it's determined beforehand. Unto the adoption of children, of sons, or actually sons, that word there really talking about an adult child, uh, sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, I'm trying not to get really wrapped up in each verse here because we're never going to get through if I do that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go quite a little faster here. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. He has made us accepted in the beloved, in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are accepted of him. Why? All because of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done on the cross of Calvary, and we've accepted it, or believe in him, and what he has done for us. In whom we have redemption. Redemption simply is talking about the payment that was made. His death on the cross was the payment that was made. How? Through his blood, which is his death, the forgiveness of sins. And because of that, we have forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. We have also obtained an inheritance because of believing of what Christ has done for us. Being predestinated, marked out again beforehand, according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his will. Um, God, would, sometimes we say that he is sovereign. Now, the word sovereign is not in the scriptures. However, if we study the scriptures, we find out that, that there is, that God is sovereign. He is, and what does that mean, being sovereign? <laughs> everything, he knows everything that's in his control, and he knows everything that's happening. Uh, we can go on and on on that, but we have obtained an, an inheritance after the counsel of his own will. In other words, his desire. I think of counsel, I think of back in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, we have the uh, <clears throat> three 
persons of the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, kind of coming together and having a council. It is the council of God deciding that they're going to make man. Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, 26, 27, right in there. They're with the creation of man. It says, let us make man in our image. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It is the counsel of God. We have the same thing recorded in Acts chapter 2 when it's speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, him dying on the cross by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. In other words, it was all planned out. Even the death of Christ was planned out way in eternity past. God knew all this was going to happen. <clears throat> and then in going to chapter 2 of Ephesians just starting out that, that particular chapter the apostle Paul writes and he says and you hath he quickened or made alive the word quickened means to make alive who were dead in trespasses and sins this is the condition we were in prior to our salvation the condition that every human being is born into when they are, <clears throat> are born into this, uh, into this world. Where in times past, you walked according to the course of this world. That's how we walk. We walked according to the course of this world prior to our salvation. Well, what is the course of this world? Who is the ruler of the world? Let's go on. The course of this world according to the prince and power of the air. Well, we find out that the prince and the power of the air is no, none other than Satan himself. Satan is the ruler of this world. Sometimes we forget that. Uh, this is his domain. This is where he and his cohorts and all the, the, um, <clears throat> the demons, uh, fallen angels, and so forth, where they work in the, uh, in the atmosphere, in the surrounding, in this world. It is his world. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. But God, but, contrast to that, God, who is rich in mercy for his great love when he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us, made us alive, together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Wow, I don't think we even begin to grasp what this means. He loved us. He quickened us. He made us alive. Together with Christ, we are with him. We are in Christ. And now it says sit, and sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Every single one of us, we have a position in the heavenlies with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are seated right there with him right now. What a truth. What a position that we have. Going on in chapter 2, it says, at that time we were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Now, he's talking about the Gentiles. The Gentiles were outside of the commonwealth of Israel. Uh, <clears throat> remember, just a little bit of history here. <laughs> if you go way back to Genesis, it's starting in the line of time, Remember on Wednesday night, we showed a dispensational chart. It has four dispensations to it. Gentiles, Jews, Gentiles, and Jews. That's all it is. Very simple to look at. It's a, it's a very brief, a broad overlook of all the scriptures. God dealt with the Gentiles all the way from Adam up to Abraham. At that time period, was a, it's, it's all, it's all condensed into the first 11 chapters of Genesis, which covers... 2,000 years. 2,000 years God dealt with those Gentiles back at that particular time. And they was, it was consistently rejecting him. So in a sense, he set the Gentiles aside and started uh, with his chosen people, the nation of Israel, in Genesis chapter 12, beginning with Abram, who later became Abraham. So this is what he's referring to. At that time... Ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Now he's going back to the, to the, to the time of before salvation, because Gentiles were outside of the commonwealth of Israel. They were outside 
of the program that God was dealing with mankind through the nation of Israel. <coughs> Only way a Gentile could be saved while God was working with the, with, the, with the Jews from Abraham all the way up through the New Testament, all the way up until we get to mid-Acts. 1,500 years God was dealing with the nation of Israel, the Jews. And that's most of our Bible. So when we study the scriptures, we must understand uh, the time when God was dealing with the nation of Israel, not the Gentiles. <coughs> so, outside of the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, speaking about all those promises from the Old Testament, um, the Old Testament prophets, uh, Abraham, uh, David, Isaiah, Jeremiah, all those Old Testament prophets. we having no hope without God in the world. But now, a change, a contrast, but now, if you look at the our dispensational chart, you'll see times past, you get to the yellow here, where we are at, what Paul is talking about, but now, that's in the age of grace, which we are living in today. But now, in Christ Jesus, he who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. In other words, those who were afar off, the Gentiles, now are made near by the blood of Christ. It's because of the cross of Calvary. For this cause I, Paul, we feed, jump into Ephesians 3 now. I'm just covering some highlights of these chapters so we understand what Ephesians 4.1 is talking about. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Now we talk a lot about the, the mystery here. Why? Because it is the revelation that was given to the Apostle Paul by the Lord Jesus Christ for the body of Christ, for the time that we are living in today, in the dispensation of the age of grace. As I wrote before in a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Now there's a lot to that mystery of Christ and that, that entire revelation that Paul received from the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, it was only Paul. He is the only one that received direct revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ concerning the mystery or the truth of the body of Christ or the truth of uh, <clears throat> the entire revelation uh, Paul's epistles that was given to him. <clears throat> the mystery of Christ. I'm not going to elaborate on that a lot, but if you come Wednesday night, you will see what the mystery of Christ really is. Because we're, we're going to come, I don't know about this Wednesday, but maybe the next Wednesday, we'll get into the mystery of the gospel or the mystery of Christ, uh, which is very interesting. He goes on to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. The body of Christ that we are members of today were as we're, we're set on a pedestal. <laughs> it, it's for all the principalities and powers of the world to see. Now, the principalities and powers, the angelic hosts and powers um, in the heavenlies, and uh, <clears throat> even the uh, principalities under Satan and powers. But it says, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. It's not talking about the church understanding the wisdom of God is talking about these principalities and powers. How do they know? How are they seeing and realizing the power of God? It is by looking at the body of Christ. We are all members. We are being watched, not only by unsaved people around us or <laughs> even believers, but we're being watched by the principalities and powers of the universe. How God has taken through the Lord Jesus Christ, has taken believers, picked them out of the world and made them members of the body of Christ and put them in Him, in Christ. That is a wonderful truth that the whole world, principalities and powers and heavenly places, even are watching and seeing, and they are beginning to understand the wisdom of God through all of this. 
Now, back to Ephesians 4.1. Therefore, now you know what the therefore is, because we have covered all these things, these, these uh, wonderful truths, uh, our position in the heavenlies and so forth, uh, what God has done for us, the cross of Calvary, through redemption, justification. We have an inheritance, a position in, in, uh, in the heavenlies with Christ. <clears throat> I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you or beg you that you walk worthy of the vocation. What's the vocation? The vocation is our position in the heavenlies. That is our vocation. At the bottom. Vocation, position. Remember, in, uh, in Ephesians chapter 1 there, seated together in heavenly places, or chapter 2, seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That is our vocation. That is what the Apostle Paul is talking about in Ephesians 4, uh, chapter 4, verse 1 here, when he says, walk worthy of the vocation. In other words, we need to walk worthy of the position that God has put us in, in Christ. Ephesians 4.2. How do we do this? It says, with all lowliness. I put in parentheses here. Uh, what we may be help us to understand, with all lowliness or humility. Being humble. And sometimes that's pretty tough to do. When things are not going right around us or somebody... Uh, uh, hurts us in some way or says something about us, something like that. Are we always just humble? <laughs> Being humble? Or it also is the opposite of pride, of <coughs> having pride, but being humble. And meekness, gentleness, with long suffering or patience, having humility, having gentleness, and patience. Well, we, a lot of times, we don't have much patience. Something goes wrong or somebody does us wrong, oh man, we're ready to fight back right away. We need to show the love of Christ in us by showing our humility, our gentleness, our patience. Forbearing one another, it means to hold up or to bear with each other. When one of us in the members of the body of Christ has uh, difficulty or a problem, whatever the case may be, it is the rest of us to bear them up or to hold them up with one another in love. Endeavoring, what does this do? Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. <clears throat> one thing I really appreciate, especially in this church, is even though we're small, we have a body of believers who really, I think, really care for each other. And when one, one, something goes wrong with one person or for sickness or whatever the case may be, we all hurt because we're all concerned about that person. And that's what understanding the scriptures really does for us. <clears throat> this I say, therefore, testify in the Lord that ye walk henceforth not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. We as believers, members of the body of Christ, should not walk as other Gentiles or unsaved Gentiles walk, as those around us. Uh, the Apostle Paul has come out amongst them and be separate. Walk not as other Gentiles in the vanity or the shallowness or the emptiness of their mind. What are they empty or, or shallow of? The truth of God's word. The truth of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for them. Therefore, <clears throat> it's going back again what we've covered in the first three chapters of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. That you put off, it says in Ephesians 4.22, that you put off concerning the former conversation of the old man. Now, the Apostle Paul uses different descriptions speaking about our old nature or old man. Sometimes it's referred to as the old man. It's our sin nature. Every single one of us who, were, who was born on this earth 
as we were born with a sin nature. And it's referred to as the old man. Which is, the corrupt, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. How do we become renewed in our mind? Ah, I think of a verse I should have had on here right away. Anyone can think of a verse that comes to mind right away about renewing your mind? Romans 12. Romans 12. Romans 12. 1. Thanks, Norm. Yeah, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. How are we renewed? How is our mind renewed? By, through the Holy Spirit, by the reading and study of God's word. Instead of following the old man, put off that old man, but put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. There's that old man, and then there's the new man. The new man we have now because of our belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, because of our salvation. We have that new nature within us. So now we have a new nature, but the old nature is still there. That's sometimes why we have difficulty in uh, <clears throat> living and walking as we should walk, because we have that constant battle between the new nature and the old nature within us. And the only way we can strengthen that new nature is by being in God's word. Wherefore, put it away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Notice it says, be ye angry. Now that kind of sets you back, doesn't it? You're reading, you're supposed to be here, uh, have humbleness and meekness and and so forth. And now he says, be ye angry. That really, what that means is to be provoked. If we should be, according to what he's saying here, be ye angry, he's saying, be provoked. What do we need to be provoked about? Notice the next three words. And sin not. As a believer, sometimes when you're out in the world, and you see people doing things, or maybe the way they speak, the way they talk. Man, I tell you, <clears throat> I was in construction for 40 years, but when you're on the construction site, uh, <coughs> you hear all kinds of things, and it just, it just makes you cringe. You know? But the line, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So be angry, be provoked about sin. I mean, we should be. <laughs> but sin not. In other words, still experience, still display your humbleness, your meekness, your lowliness. Then he says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. In other words, if you're upset about something or somebody does something wrong and to you or whatever, or you do something wrong to them, or whatever the case may be, settle it now. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to use to edifying, edifying being building each other up. So many more verses I could go to here, but uh, building each other up, and that's what we need to do as believers, members of the body of Christ that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. That grieving means to afflict with sorrow. In other words, don't afflict sorrow on the Holy Spirit by the way you're living and what you do. If you do, that grieves the Spirit. Whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. It's the Holy Spirit within us. The Holy Spirit is now dwells within us as a believer, and He is the one who has sealed us till the day of redemption, until the rapture takes place. Another verse, Ephesians 1.13, going back there, it says, In whom also ye trusted, after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. What a truth that is, knowing 
that we are eternally secure in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let all bitterness and wrath, intense passion of the mind, and anger, this anger here, notice this one, and anger, it's a, this, this particular word has a real, it means that have, you have such a passion that you want to be even maybe kill somebody. Real intense passion. It goes with intense passion of the mind. Clamor, clamor is nothing more than just hollering and screaming at the top of your lungs. <laughs> evil speaking, be put away from you with all malice or all evil habits. Be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Wow, just think of that. How are we to forgive one another the same way that Christ forgave us? Is there anything that a person could do where Christ would not forgive us? Nothing. And that's the same way we are to forgive one another. You being dead in your sins and uncircumcised of your flesh, hath he quickened together, made alive with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. When the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, as we look back, what he has accomplished for us, we took, he took care of all of our sins, every single one of them. All trespasses. Oh, let's see. I'm trying to hurry up here. We're way over time already. Um, I'm going to go on here. Colossians chapter 2 is a very good uh, chapter also. And uh, it's talking about the walk of a believer. But here in Ephesians 5, just to kind of sum it up, Ephesians 5.1, it says, Be therefore, therefore what I've just told you, about how to live in, in Ephesians 4. Now he says Ephesians 5, and he says, Be imitators of God as dear children. Paul speaks about this, I think, about three times, of being imitators of me, or followers of me. Be followers of me, which means imitate me. Well, well how does he clarify that? In Christ. And walk in love. And, of course, that love is agape love, uh, unconditional love, as Christ also has loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and sacrifice of God for a sweet selling savor. End up with this particular verse in the <clears throat> last chapter of the book of Romans, Romans 16, 25. It says, Now to him that is of power to establish you or to establish you according to my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. How are we to be established as a believer? Established and be able to stand strong against the wiles of the devil? It's according to the Paul's gospel. He says, my gospel. And he clarifies that in the preaching of Jesus Christ. What? A how? According to the revelation of the mystery. There's no way a person today can walk worthy of their vocation if they do not understand the mystery, the revelation that was given to the Apostle Paul, because in that revelation gives us the benefits of the cross of Calvary. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the truths of Scripture. We just pray, Heavenly Father, now that you would uh, give us that desire to stay in your word, and uh, <clears throat> that we might have that desire to tell others about the revelation of the mystery which entails the Lord Jesus Christ and the cross of Calvary. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this time now and those that have come out. Be with us now. We just pray now that you would guide and protect us uh, in this world that we live in today. And this we ask is your precious name. Amen.